Good morning. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of God. It's good to be in the presence of the people of God. I believe that God has a word this morning. You do not absolutely want to miss this at all. If you know anybody, and I do mean anybody that needs a word from God, I believe today he has given us a word that's fitly spoken for our due season, a word that will bless us both now and as we move forward into this year, this upcoming year. We're finding ourselves at the last Sunday of 2020. Uh, many of us can remember the anticipation for 2020, looking forward to it and the things that would unfold or seemingly that we anticipated to unfold. Well, here we are at the end, and I thank God that he has brought us thus far. Um, I'll get into that a little bit later. If you will allow me to go into a word of prayer, uh, I'd advise you at this moment, if you've got watch parties that you want to start, individuals that you know that need a word from God, somebody that you know that's been troubled by the things that have been transpiring, get them to hear the broadcast. I believe it's going to bless them. I believe it will encourage them, and I believe it will be a blessing to them personally. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, I thank you again for your kindness and your mercy. Lord, I want to say especially thank you for your word. God, as we look at the things that we've faced and we've had to deal with, your word has been our comfort, it's been our strength, it's indeed been our refuge. Your word teaches us that the name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous runneth therein and are safe. Thank you for providing the safety of the name of the Lord our God. Father, today open up our eyes to see your instructions, open up our ears to hear your instructions. And Lord, open our heart to do your instructions. In Christ's name, amen and amen. Well, again, I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. I pray that you are doing well. I want to uh, encourage you to get comfortable. Sit in a, a place that's comfortable. Get where you're not distracted because I believe God has a word for us. And I'm excited about this word. I couldn't wait to get here and be able to share this word. Before I get into the word of God for today, I want to encourage you for Thursday. I want to encourage you for watch night. I want to encourage you to join us for our watch night service at 10 p.m. on Thursday evening. We have a treat for you. It is going to bless you. I promise you it will bless you. We're excited. We're looking forward to an opportunity of sharing with you in the word of God, being able to come and just share and, and, and virtually be able to bless the Lord together. We're going to bring in 2021. We're going to worship God. We're going to hear the word of God. And we're going to trust and believe God to be with us, not just in 2020, but in 2021 and beyond if the Lord so tarries. So we look forward to uh, this evening, well, this Thursday evening coming up, and I am excited. I want you to be a part. I want you to get people to tune in. I want you to get people, people, listen, we're in a 10 o'clock curfew in the state of North Carolina. So we're not going to have everybody out, but we're going to have you virtually with us. If you want to hear what God is saying going into 2021, tune in. I believe it will bless you. Let's look at the word of God today. I want to uh, talk with you this morning. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. That word strengthen, it actually means that infuses us with his ability. I believe that we can do all things through Christ who infuses us with his ability. See, it's not my ability, it's Christ ability. You know, people are talking about how terrible 2020 was and how their glad is nearly over. To say that 2020 was a year of adversity and change would be an understatement for some people. However, the real question is, how resilient are you? How resilient are you? This morning, I want to talk to you from the subject, embracing the kingdom movement through resiliency. Embracing the kingdom movement through resiliency. The word resilient means it's the ability to recover from, it's the ability to recover from or adjust. Listen to this. 
Listen, I, I, let me go slow. It's the ability to recover from or adjust easily. Listen to this. Easily to adversity or change. So it's the ability to recover from or adjust easily to adversity or change. Many people will say 2020 was full of adversity and change. Many people will say, ah, oh, it's just bad. But how resilient are you? How much ability do you possess to recover easily from the adversity of 2020 and the change of 2020? That's the question. Listen to this. Number one, not being resilient can hinder your blessing. Not being resilient can hinder your blessing. Go with me to 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 5 verse 1. Now I might get a little happy somewhere along that, but just bear with me. 2 Kings chapter 5 verse 1, the Bible says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, an honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. You know, sometimes our outward achievements do not always fulfill our inward desires. You see, Naaman was great. He had a great reputation. People knew about the things he had achieved. People knew all of, all, all of the accolades that he had collected, how he was an honorable man before the leadership. But the thing about Naaman, the Bible says, but he was a leper. See, sometimes all of our outward achievements still do not fulfill our inward desires. Verse 2, the Bible says, And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife, and she said unto her mistress, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that's in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. You know, no one is insignificant in the kingdom. No one is insignificant in the kingdom. The Bible says she was a little maid. They didn't give her name. All they let you know is what she did. See, sometimes our name being mentioned isn't what's important. It's what we do. And nobody is insignificant in the kingdom. Verse 4. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. In other words, this little maid, her words influenced the king. She was a captive. She didn't come there willingly. She was working, if you will, for her master. And her words influenced the king. See, you do not have to be there for your words to go there. Let me say it again. You do not have to be there for your words to go there. We're, going, we're warming up here. We're going to get there in a minute. See, you never know who God is using to change your situation. You never know who God is. You See, it was a little maid. They didn't even mention her name. But she was the one God was using to change Naaman's situation. Verse 8. And it was so. I'm skipping down to verse 8 here. And it says, And it was so when Elijah, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, says, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me. In other words, don't, 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 don't get upset. Let him come to me. And he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. See, your recovery is not just about you. Sometimes we think that our situation is all about us. But your recovery is not just about you. See, everybody knew about Naaman and everybody knew about Naaman's condition. So him being sent, the prophet said, well, come on. He's going to know that there's a prophet in Israel. 
Verse 9, so Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. Uh, before we go on before this, I believe it, it bears uh, justice that we sit and take a moment to look at what Naaman has done. The Bible says Naaman came with his horses and his chariots. In other words, Naaman took the opportunity to make sure that he brought all of the pump and circumstances of his accolades and his accomplishments with him as he stood in the front of the door of the prophet. Naaman came as a, a, a ambassador, if you will. He came dressed to the T. He came looking the part of his success. He came bringing his achievements with him. He came wearing, if you will, his medals on his chest. It was to let him know that I am somebody. It was to let him know that you're not just having anybody stand before you. And the Bible says he came and he stood at the door of the house of Elijah. He didn't go in. He didn't knock. He didn't announce. He didn't come and say, well, you know what? The, here I am. I am, you know, I, I am who I am. You need to come out. He stood there as though saying, well, you know what? Because of who I am, you should be happy I'm at your house. See, sometimes our condition makes us want to overcompensate because in all of this, Naaman is still the one with the problem. Naaman is still the one who has leprosy. See, we hope sometimes that our reputation, our accolades, or our accomplishments will blind you to our true inadequacies. I hope that while I'm standing out here dressed to the teeth, I hope that while you're able to look outside your window and see my horses and my chariot, I hope that when you see the medals on my chest and the way I'm dressed and you realize who I am, I hope that you won't see my real inadequacy. I hope that the leprosy won't be, see, won't be the first thing that comes to your mind when you see me. See, sometimes we want our accolades, our accomplishments to blind you to our real inadequacies. So Naaman, standing outside, his horses and his chariot, Verse 10, the Bible says, and Elijah sent a messenger unto him saying, go and wash in Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. Wait, wait, wait a minute. The, the prophet didn't come outside. Not only did he not come outside, he sent a messenger. Elijah didn't even look. Elijah didn't even take the time to Acknowledge the accomplishments, the accolades, the achievements. He sent a messenger and gave him a word. He didn't take time to acknowledge the fine horses and the chariot. Notice this. He only addressed what the issue was. He only said, go and wash in Jordan seven times and your flesh shall come again to thee. Because after all, Elijah saw the inadequacy not the accolades. Verse 11, but Naaman was wroth and went away and said, behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord of his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. You know, we sometimes have in our mind how we want God to move. And if he doesn't fit our plan, then we get upset. This is what happened to Naaman. Naaman said, well, I thought he'd come out and tell me and call on the name of his God, lay his hands. Well, I, I, I don't understand. I thought it was going to happen a different way. I thought God was going to use me a different way. I thought God was going to show me this. I thought he was. See, you thought like Naaman thought. See, we're talking about resiliency. We're talking about having the ability. Listen to this. Having to, the ability to recover easily from adversity or change. So here's Naaman with the adversity of leprosy. Here's Naaman dealing with all his accolades, his, his accomplishments, his achievements, all of the pomp and circumstances of his position, but yet he can't deal with a little change. A little change that it didn't happen like he thought it would happen. A little change that it was other than what he considered acceptable. So look at what the Bible says. Naaman was wroth. In other words, he was hot. 
Naaman was heated and he went away. And he said, behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. He says in verse 12, are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. See, we think we know a better way. He was upset and he said, I think I know a better way. These rivers I know of are better than the rivers that he's talking about. I could have just done it this way. I could have just handled it like this. I could have took care of it myself. No, 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 no. See, oftentimes our better way involves us not humbling ourselves. Did you hear that? Oftentimes our better way involves us not humbling ourselves. See, you looked at the better way of the rivers that you knew of. You looked at the fact that you could come and still be who you are in your position, in your title, in your accolades, in your accomplishments, and just go to a convenient place. You didn't look at the humility of having to stand out in front of the house of the prophet and a messenger come out and give you a word. The prophet not even acknowledging your accomplishment. See, you looked at a way that you can still stay in pride not a way that you would humble yourself. Oh, I know I'm preaching better than you saying amen, but hold on, it's going to get better. See, the Bible says, look at that. So he turned and went away in a rage. What are you saying, Pastor? A lack of resiliency is often displayed by rage and frustration. A lack of resiliency is often displayed by rage and frustration. See, when we are not uh, in a position where we're using our ability to adapt, if you will, or to recover from easily adversity or change, when we get to the place where we can't adjust anymore, we're often in a fit of rage and frustration. We can't deal with the people around us. We're get, they're everybody getting on our nerves. It's, see, the reality is it's us. It's not the people around us, it's us. Because somewhere along the line, we have decided to no longer become resilient. We have decided that the frustration of the moment, the things that are happening around us, is, is bothering us to the point where now we're, we're lashing out at everybody and everything. See, the resiliency, I thought the scripture says we can do all things through Christ which strengthened us. I thought that we were able to adjust and adapt to all of the situations and circumstances because we were being infused with the ability of Christ. See, but it could it possibly be that we're at a moment where we don't want to humble ourselves. Because God has given us the ability to be resilient. He's given us the ability to adjust easily, to recover from, to adjust easily to the change and the adversity of life if we would simply humble ourselves. Let me keep going. Verse 13. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? He said, wait a minute. Now, I know you're the man in charge, but now if he'd ask you to do something great, you'd have done that. He says, how much rather than when he said to thee, wash, and be clean. In other words, if he'd asked you something great, you'd have done that. But all he said was, go get in the river over here and wash and you'll be clean. In other words, why is that such a problem? Unless it's your ego. Verse 14. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. See, God can use your resiliency to cause you to recover what you really desire if you embrace the change. Some people are fighting against the change. Well, I, I can't wait to get out of 2020. This is terrible. This has been a rough year. I can't believe this. Oh, God has something great for me. He does. If you learn to adjust and recover from easily the change and the adversity, his grace is still sufficient. No matter what the trial, 
no matter what the test, no matter what you're going through, his grace is still sufficient. Why don't you be still for a moment? Know that he's God. Let him be exalted in the earth and let him be exalted amongst the heathen. He's still God. Maybe it's just you being flustered by what's happening around you because God can use your resiliency to cause you to recover what you really desire if you embrace the change or you can live a life of frustration and rage. Let me go on to point number two. Not only can a lack of resiliency hinder our blessing, but our old way of thinking can be detrimental to resiliency. Our old way of thinking can be detrimental to our resiliency. See, we can be resilient, but we get caught up in the way that we think. An old way of thinking. I heard someone say this once, that the greatest challenge or the enemy of the new move of God is the old move of God. In other words, we are so caught up in the way God used to do things that when he changes or does something different, we are the ones who are criticizing it and complaining it and working against it because we have become comfortable with the old way. Beloved, I have news for you. 2021 will be a new way. It will be new, it will be different, and we're gonna to have to adjust. We're going to have to deal with the change. We're gonna to have to learn to easily adapt to the change. It's gonna be different. So our old way of thinking can be detrimental to our resiliency. Go with me to 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 1. Give me a few minutes and I'll be closing up here. The Bible says, Then Elijah said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. If you are familiar with this story, you realize that they're dealing with a famine. You realize there's an absolute food shortage throughout the entire land that people are literally starving to death. It has been a very, very difficult time. They're dealing with a uh, past that has been uh, really uh, something that has been challenging to them as a people. And now, lo and behold, a man of God stands up and says, you're going to have an abundance of food. You're going to have so much food that is going to be cheap for you to buy it. So they hear good news during a very bad time. Let me say that again. They hear good news during a very bad time. Verse 2. Then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. Now, when you understand the context of the story, the prophet is speaking to the king. And he's telling the king that you're going to have an abundance of food. It's going to be cheap. God is going to solve this dilemma that's happening about this time tomorrow. But there's a gentleman there that is a uh, support of the king, that is a uh, part of the king's entourage or advisory council. And he, when the prophet speaks to the king, this gentleman speaks. Not that the prophet was speaking to him. Not that the prophet addressed him. You know, let me just cut to the chase. Sometimes you just need to be quiet. When ain't nobody talking to you, don't say nothing. I, I, I know that, 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 that may not seem like good preaching, but you know what? Sometimes it's just good to be quiet. And he says to him, he said, listen, if God was to open up the windows of heaven, this couldn't even happen. I am finding out just because we do not know how God can do something doesn't give us the right to not believe it. Just because we don't know how God can do something does not give us the right to not believe it. See, it's old way of thinking. 
Well, I ain't never seen that before. It's a whole lot of things you ain't never seen. You ever seen your heart beat? But all these years it's been beat. Never, you ever seen your brain? Nope. All these years you've had one. See, it's a lot of things we've never seen, but that don't change what God says. And I'm not going to worry about just because I've never seen it happen this way. That don't mean God can't do it. Verse three. And there were four leprous men at the entering end of the gate. And they said one to another, why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we st sit still here, we die also. Now, therefore, come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. Let me say this again. No one is beyond God being able to use them, including you. The Bible said here four leprous men. You have to understand simply because of them being lepers, they've become outcast of society. They've been ostracized. They've been removed from the general population. They're no, no, no longer even considered part of the population. But yet God is in the midst of them and he's using four people who are ostracized from the community. You know, sometimes we think that we're beyond God using us, maybe because of some mistake we've made, maybe because of some way people see us, maybe because we've just simply been along and ain't been used in a while. Beloved, I got news for you. Nobody is beyond God using them, including you. Verse five. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even a noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. You have to understand the actual scene that is transpiring here. The Syrians had uh, besieged, if you will, Samaria. They had surrounded it. They knew the Syrians were out there. They knew that they had a host, all that covered the ground, looking like grasshoppers. They knew that they had all of these people out there, and they was literally starving them to death. It was a matter of time before they would walk out the gate and simply give up because of starvation, or a matter of time before the Syrians would come and kick in the gate and go and defeat everybody because they were so weak from starvation. Simply a matter of time. It wasn't that they didn't know that the enemy had them surrounded. It wasn't that they didn't know that the enemy had the uh, upper hand on them. They were fully aware of this. The king and everybody in there. But it's four leprous people that say, well, listen, which way should we go? If we go back into Samaria, we're going to die there anyway. Ain't no food there. If we go over to the Syrians, maybe they'll, maybe they'll allow us to live and at least feed us. So they walk to the Syrian camp. And in the midst of them walking to the camp, they start to see that there's nobody there. They start to realize, you know, this is mighty strange. It was the other day, everybody was home. The other day, we were hearing all of the noise of the camp. The other day, the enemy and all of his threats, we were hearing it. But today, nobody's home. And the Bible says, for the Lord, verse 6, had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host of chariots and a noise of horse. Look at this. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egypt. In other words, some kind of way, the king must have got reinforcements. That's what the Syrian army was thinking. Let me, let me just jump straight to the point here. God has been working behind the scenes in the enemy's camp. You've heard the enemy's noise. You knew he was there. You knew that your situation, you were surrounded. You knew things weren't looking good. But I want you to know, beloved, God has been working in the enemy's camp. There was a sound that you didn't hear. There was something that took place that you didn't know. There was something going on. You were like, God, where are you? What are you doing? Well, right now, you're not the priority. Right now, the priority was dealing with the enemy's camp. He knew you were all right where you were, so he simply dealt with the enemy's camp. And it was in the enemy's camp that the noise was being made. It was in the enemy's camp that there was something going on. It was in the enemy's camp that the noise was causing the enemy to think something else was transpiring. My goodness, Lord, Lord, Lord. Verse seven. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight 
and left their tents mm -mm -mm, and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and they did eat and drink and carried then silver and gold and raiment and went in and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried this also and went and hid it. Verse nine. And they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings. Listen to this. This day is a good is a day of good tidings. In other words, this is a day of good news. Well, let, let me let me stop. Let me stop. And we hold our peace. If we tarry to the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now, therefore, come that we may go and tell the king's household. Listen. Because your day starts off rough doesn't mean it end that way. Because your day starts off rough doesn't mean it'll end that way. 24 hours earlier, they were wondering where they were going to go. Are we going to go back to Samaria or die? Are we going to go over here in Syria with them in Damascus and die? Well, either way, we'll see what happens. Because your day starts off rough doesn't mean it'll end that way. Some blessings, listen to what they said. You know what? If we tarry here, this ain't the right thing to do. We need to go and tell the king's household. Because some blessings are so big, you know others have to share in it. See, some of us have been accustomed to being blessed where we were blessed. How about when you get so blessed that you know this is bigger than me? This has got to be shared with somebody else. Beloved, get ready. Things are about to change. Things are about to change. Verse 10. So they came and called unto the porter of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied, and asses tied, and tents as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. See, when you are resilient like these four lepers were, your words will make it to the king. That's a Selah moment. When you are resilient, what do you mean, Pastor? When you tap into the power that God has given you to bounce back from the adversity and the change of life, to recover from it easily, to adjust to it easily, when you become resilient in your faith, your words will make it to the king. Verse 15. And they went after them unto Jordan, and lo, all the way was full of garments, I'm skipping to verse 15 for sake of time. And they went after them unto Jordan, and lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels, which the Syrians had cast away in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king, and the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Listen, God can change your situation overnight. That's why you need to stay resilient. That's why you need to walk in the fact and the reality that you can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth you. Because God can change your situation overnight. You have to understand just because it looked like this when you got up, don't mean it's going to look like that when you go to sleep. God can change it overnight. Look at verse 17. And the king appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have the charge of the gate. And the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died, as the man of God had said, who spake when the king came down to him. In other words, his old way of thinking prevented him from being resilient. Remember, he said, if God opened up the windows, how could this thing happen? Well, when it happened, the prophet told him, he said, listen, you're going to see it, but you won't partake of it. See, some of us, if we're not careful and tap into the resiliency of God, not what CNN is saying, tap into the resiliency of God, not what ABC is saying, tap into the resiliency of God, not what CBS is saying, because if we would become resilient, if we would recognize that we have the ability, we possess the ability, we have it if we would just adjust, we can recover from the adversity of the hour, we can recover from easily the change of the hour if we tap into who God says we are because after all we can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth us see his old way of thinking prevented him from being resilient 
his lack of resiliency caused him to miss out on what God has for his people. Verse 18, and we're about to close. <clears throat> Verse 18, and it says, And it came to pass, as the man of God has spoken to the king, saying, Two measures of barley for a shekel, and a measure of fine flour for a shekel, shall be tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. Listen to this, and we're closing. Resiliency can get you to the tomorrow that makes you forget about today. Resiliency can get you to the tomorrow that makes you forget about today. Listen, I'm not saying that today is not full of adversity. I'm not saying that 2020 has not been a rough year. Let me, let, let me, let me share something with you. In March of 2020 this year, it was one of the worst year, one of the worst times of my entire life. My body was racked with pain. I didn't know if I was going to make it day in and day out. It was that difficult each and every day, each and every moment. But you know what? Resiliency got me past that day so I could see my tomorrow. Your resiliency in God can do the same thing for you. I don't care what it looks like today. The resiliency that God has put in you when he said that you can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth you. The resiliency that God put in you said, listen, you can recover from any adversity easily. You can recover from any change easily if you simply recognize that you got to put your, your faith and your trust in God. Resiliency can get you to the tomorrow that makes you forget about today. Listen, <clears throat> resiliency can show you what you couldn't see today. So you have to realize that that Lord whose hand the king leaned on, he couldn't see the next day because he wasn't resilient. Resiliency can get you to the day that you can't see right now. Listen, I know that some of you all are dealing with situations. This has been a tough year on you. And you're just saying, Pastor, you don't know I lost my job. Pastor, you don't know this happened to me. Pastor, you don't know that's. Listen, maybe I don't know. But I want to encourage you to be resilient. Let me let me keep on so I can close out. <laughs> oh, my good. This is a good one. Resiliency is what allows you to see what God has been working on. Resiliency is what allows you to see what God has been working on. You ever have those moments in your life where it seems like God is quiet? You praying, you seeking him. You're like, God, what's going on? What's, what's happening? God, why are you not talking to me? What's, see, he's working on something. He's working on something in your favor. Resiliency is what allows you to hang in there to recover from the adversity and the change and to see what God was working on. What do you mean? So you have to understand the lepers were resilient enough to get up and go to the enemy's camp even though they were hungry, even though they were tired, even though they had dealt with all of the frustrations of being besieged or uh, encamped around all of that time. But they were resilient enough to go right into the enemy's camp and they saw that God had sent a noise that caused the Syrians to leave everything, to leave their entire camp so that they now were able to get what God had been working on all that time. Oh, I'm preaching better than you saying amen. <clears throat> well, let's close with this. Listen, resiliency doesn't quit. Resiliency doesn't give up. Re resiliency doesn't bow down or give in. Resiliency sounds like this. In Job chapter 14, verse 14, Job says it this way. All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change comes. All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. I don't care what it feel like. I don't care what it look like. I don't care what people are saying. All the days of my appointed life will I wait till my change come. See, I know something is coming and I'm going to wait on my change to come. I'm not going to abandon ship. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to give up. I'm not throwing in the towel. I'm not going to lay back and become complacent because I'm going to be resilient. I want to encourage you to use your ability to recover easily from adversity or change and hold on to your faith in God. It's about to pay off in a big way. It's about to pay off in a big way. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what you're doing and I miss. 
God, I thank you for the hearts that you have spoken to today. I pray that they would hear your voice. Let them that have ears hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto his people. I pray, Father, that their heart, the Spirit, would be encouraged, Lord, to be resilient. Lord, that they would be encouraged to recover from the adversity of the times that they've gone through, that they will be encouraged to recover from the change that has taken place on this year. Some people have dealt with things that they didn't see coming at all, things that they weren't even expecting. But Lord, I thank you. You allowed it to happen because you know that they were resilient enough to come through it and see the day that you've already prepared. Father, I pray that this word would bless your people and that their hearts would be encouraged to know that you've got a change that's well worth waiting for. Father, we thank you and we honor you in Christ's name. Amen. Listen, if you're not born again, the greatest amount of resiliency that you can ever, ever demonstrate is coming out of darkness into the marvelous light of Jesus Christ. I don't know any other way to share with you truth other than to give you scripturally Scripture truth. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. When you acknowledge that you are a sinner, when you recognize that you have come short of the standard that God has for all mankind, and you recognize that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Anointed One, that he died for your sins, he died for my sins, and he, raised, he was raised again from the dead. When you recognize this, you are ready for salvation. I want you to pray with me now. You know you're not saved. You know you don't have a relationship with God. I'm not even talking about going to church. I'm not talking about what your grandmother did, your grandfather. I'm not talking about who your parents are. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you having a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm talking about where your heart, your soul is. This is not about your occupation. This is not what you'll do in your future, who you marry, who, all of those things. Listen, all of that pales in comparison because if you do not have a relationship with Christ, it will not matter. You have seen death displayed on our television this year, but yet you sit here with the ability to hear my voice and to know what God is saying to you. Right now, you have an opportunity to change your, des your destiny. And it's simply by acknowledging your sin and accepting Jesus' forgiveness. I want you to pray with me. If you'll be honest enough with yourself, or you could be like Naaman. You could go away angry. Wow, that's all he's saying? That's all he got to say? I thought he was going to say something else. See? We have our own thoughts for the way things should be. For God has plainly said what it takes to be saved. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. I humble myself before you. I pray now, forgive me and come into my heart. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you were buried. And I believe you rose again on the third day. I thank you for saving me. Amen and amen. See, when we humble ourselves before God, the miraculous can take place. When we recognize and acknowledge who he is, the miraculous can take place. Because the burden is no longer on us to be something that we were never designed to be. Now you're into the family of God. I welcome you with open arms into the family of God. I pray that you are encouraged. And listen, I want to encourage you even the more so. We have a prayer line. I want, to, I want to encourage you, call our prayer line. Maybe you need prayer about some situation. Maybe there's something going on in your family. Maybe there are things that are transpiring in life. You just say, I want somebody to pray with me about this. What's wrong with having prayer? This is a wonderful time to get people to pray with you. I, I want you to reach out to that prayer line right now. Someone is on the other end waiting for you to call. 
and they could be in agreement with you to pray with you. Call us now. If you don't want to call us an email, feel free to email us. Someone will email you back and make sure that what you need, they're able to give you scripturally. They're able to support you in what you're going through. It's on you now. It's on you to reach out so that somebody can help them. You know, our, our world has become so prideful that we no longer want to ask for help. Everybody needs help at some point in time. Everybody. Or you could be like Naaman. Live your life in rage and frustration because you're not willing to reach out for help. But I don't believe that's you. I believe today the Spirit of the Lord has challenged you and caused you to recognize that you can be resilient, resilient enough to embrace the kingdom movement and see what God has for you. Listen, I want to encourage you to tune in on this Thursday. This Thursday night, we're not having our Wednesday night service. Our regular Wednesday night service is moved to Thursday. It's moved to Thursday at 10 p.m. We're going to do a Facebook Live broadcast, uh, and I believe it will bless you. I believe God has a word for us as we go into this new year. And I want to encourage you, not only for you to tune in, but I want to encourage you now, between now and Thursday, get some individuals who need to hear a word going into 2021, who know that, listen, if I, I need to hear from God. I need to hear from God. We have family members. Listen, I want you to reach out to them. Let's make 2021 a year where God is glorified. Let's make sure that we're in a place to hear what he's saying. I encourage you to meet me on Thursday night at 10 p.m. for our watch night service. God bless you and thank you for taking the opportunity of being with us today. God bless you.